The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT, Take 12 Radio, or our affiliates. The opinions on this show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice and are those of the host, co-host, and guest. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. One day at a time with its failures and fears With portion of pain and burden of care We must be Welcome to Walking Through the Language of the Heart. All right, hold your horses. Thank you, Colin, our announcer there. Uh, I appreciate that. But once again, this week, we interrupt Walking Through the Language of the Heart to bring to you a Get to Know Chris S. a Little Better Part 2. And hopefully next week we'll be back with uh, a new episode of Walking Through the Language of the Heart. If you'd like to get caught up on that series uh, we've done like 45 episodes so far. Visit us at Take12Radio.com. Click on the Recovery Workshops banner, and there you'll find Walking Through the Language of the Heart as well as other workshops that we've done with Chris. Okay, um, so this week Chris is going to be talking about the chapter in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous entitled The Family Afterwards. Here's Chris. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it's great being here tonight. Uh, I look forward to coming here all day. Uh, I see some new faces out out there tonight, and uh, just briefly, I'll talk a little bit about this meeting. This meeting is kind of different than uh, the normal meeting that you're going to run into out there in uh, uh, North Jersey AA. Uh, We specifically uh, try to stay very focused on uh, the solution. Uh, the solution to alcoholism, the solution to uh, our, our spiritual bedevilments, uh, and all the other things that tend to plague an alcoholic. Uh, we, we tend to stay focused on the solution uh, that's found in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm certainly not alone uh, when, I, when I say that uh, uh, there's an experience to be had uh, from following the instructions in the, in the book. Uh, Actually, taking the spiritual exercises uh, leads leads into a real renewed attitude and outlook on one's life, uh, a new perception, um, a new way of operating uh, out there in the world, and uh, it's that new perception and that new operational system that really is the spiritual awakening. The spiritual awakening really is the treatment for alcoholism. Uh, um, one of the things that you see happening a lot in AA today is people uh, putting their their faith and their their trust um, in things other than uh, what the book Alcoholics Anonymous and the early AA members uh, believed you needed to put your faith and your trust in. As an example, uh, you'll see uh, you'll see people um, um, who uh, really, really are able to stay sober through meeting dependency. Uh, I know, uh, I know of uh, of people who uh, take on massive amounts of service commitments, and um, you know these are things that the book says will keep you sober. Uh, it'll it'll generate a, an atmosphere of sobriety. But there's a deeper answer. You know, there's a deeper uh, solution to be found in this book. Uh, there's a there's a freedom. A lot of people settle for relief from alcoholism when freedom is available, and uh, it's become unfashionable in AA to to grab hold of the principles in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It's become more fashionable to keep it simple and to easy does it and a lot of other things. Uh, However, the, 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 the program of recovery as it's laid out in this book and as it was practiced by the, the first 100 and as it's been practiced by many, many 
alcoholics uh, in the years since, brings about a revolutionary change in an individual. Uh, it brings about um, an awakening, a spiritual awakening. And if you have a spiritual awakening, uh, it would then make sense that you were spiritually asleep, wouldn't it? Because you don't awaken from something you're already awoke to. Um, one of the things that, uh, that tends to plague an alcoholic and tends to interfere with any spiritual progress is um, delusion. Uh, de delusion is not denial. Denial is knowing the truth and saying that ain't the truth. We, we suffer from delusion. We think everything's okay. We think that uh, we don't need to do the steps. We think that we can keep ourselves sober. That's the, the, the biggest illusion there is out there in AA, is thinking you can keep yourself sober by what you do or how you think. Uh, and the book, a hundred different ways, blows that illusion out of the water. Uh, I was, uh, I was at, a ho out at the hospital. My brother was uh, undergoing some some uh, bypass surgery this week, and it just so happened that two alcoholics were in the hospital with him. One of them is a member in good standing with many, many years. He was there for bypass also. And the other was an individual that uh, I have gone on repeated 12-step calls uh, on this guy. When I, I had to sneak in to see him, he was in, uh, uh, he was in uh, intensive care. He had had his second esophageal hemorrhage. Now, if anybody knows anything about those, you're lucky to get a second one. I mean, not many people make it through a second one. It's basically when the alcohol and the stomach uh, uh, acids have corroded your esophagus to such a point that the, the blood vessels just hemorrhage and you usually bleed out, which is, you know, not something we recommend to newcomers. Um, this guy just gets done having his second esophageal, and he's laying in bed, and, uh, and me and, uh, and his sponsor show up, and we start talking to him. And the uh, first thing I said to him was, like, look, pal, you are in way more trouble than you think you are. Whatever you're thinking right now, you're minimizing like a sumbitch. You are in real trouble. You're in way more trouble. You know, you're really in trouble. And he goes, well, I know. The doctor told me if I have one more drink, I'm going to die. So I think I got it this time. And I said to him, if you think the doctor telling you that if you die, the next time you drink is going to keep you from drinking, you haven't learned anything. You haven't learned anything. You can't keep yourself sober, even if it means you're going to die, unfortunately. And uh, he looked at me funny. And again, some people just don't get it. Sometimes they need an experience, a spiritual experience to part the clouds long enough for them to really see the truth because they're, they're in delusion. Because after I went through this whole song and dance about how powerless he is and how he needs to plug into AA and he needs to do this and he needs to work the steps and he needs to find God and he needs to get a spiritual experience, he goes, I just want to run something past you. <clears throat> how about... My parents are up in Maine, and they got a really big house. How about if I go up there and convalesce? You know, I'll st there's no alcohol up there. I'm like, yeah, there's no alcohol in Maine. All right. I'm like, I'm like I don't think so. I think you're heading right back to Happy Hills, where, where they can lock you away, where you, where you won't be able to hurt yourself or anybody else around you. It's Happy Hills time. And then when you get out, Hopefully, hopefully you'll have in your consciousness the understanding that you need to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous, grab a serious sponsor, grab them by the shirt, and say, just tell me what to do. I don't care what it is, I'll do it. And if you have that kind of willingness, then maybe, you know, maybe your esophagus and you uh, might be able to make it through the year. Otherwise, uh, uh, you and your esophagus are going <laughs> to are going to have an awful hard time. Um, so I truly believe that there's a lot of delusion going on. And um, the insanity that they talk about in the second step, I believe that thinking anything but a spiritual awakening will treat your alcoholism.
That's the insanity that they talk about in the second step, that we need to be restored to. Um, tonight, we're going to be going over the family afterward. When I, first re- when I first saw this chapter, I'm like, oh, man, you know, the family afterward. I ain't got no family. You know, there is no family afterward. The, 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 there's a family gone. Is there a chapter for that? The family split? Because if there's a chapter the family split, I'll read that. But, uh, um, you know, I came in here, and of course my, my family left when I needed them most, you know. And, and my wife packed up one day, emptied the bank account, took the car, took my daughter, and the ultimate insult was she took my dog. She said, you, I, don't, I don't trust you to take care of this. You know, I'm taking the dog. And so, uh, uh, so it, was, it was pretty brutal. So the family afterward, I'm thinking. Um, Today I have a family. Today I have a family. And you know what? The family that left is still a part of my life. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a daughter. Uh, uh, the ex-wife uh, is, is uh, a lot of times uh, seeking guidance from me, which I've got to tell you right, right there, that's a, that's a pretty big miracle. You know, her asking me what my opinion is. <laughs> you know? Back in, back in the old days, if she wanted my opinion, she'd lift my head up, you know, off the floor and ask me. But, but uh, today, uh, uh, today, today it's different. So the, the, fam- the family afterward, um, I'm going to read a little. He jumps around a, a lot in this chapter, making different points here and there. So that's what I'm going to do, uh, just to stay in continuity. This is the page, bottom of page 122. <coughs> Cessation of drinking is but the first step away from a highly strained, abnormal condition. A doctor said to us, years of living with an alcoholic is almost sure to make any wife or child neurotic. The entire family is, to some extent, ill. Uh, What happens in a family unit while an alcoholic is getting ill, and you have to understand, this happens over sometimes 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years of time. So it, it's, it's, like, it's like when you take a frog and you put him in a, a pot of water and you turn the heat up. He doesn't notice the change in temperature and hop out until you boil him, you know. It's kind of the same thing with family members. You stick them in a pre-alcoholic family unit and allow the, allow the alcoholic to like, like grow through all the stages of alcoholism to acute alcoholism. And by the time you get there, they're used to it. You know, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's miserable, but it's my misery, you know, type of attitude. And to, to, to a certain degree, and not in every case, but to a certain degree, a lot of the family members are ill. They're, they're, they have psychological difficulties that, you know, they, they, they grow into adulthood needing massive amounts of therapeutics, you know, and, uh, and, and this just happens uh, with certain families more than with others. Also, um, alcoholism, um, whether or not it's, it's inheritable, it's certainly a, you, have, you get genetic predispositions to be alcoholic. Say if both your parents were alcoholic, there's like a 70% chance of you being alcoholic, you know. And, uh, uh, and, and there's certain parts of the population where there's a real small chance of you being alcoholic. So they know it's, they know it's, uh, it's, it's hereditary. But what happens is that as the alcoholic's self-centered lifestyle begins to blossom, the family members react in different ways. And they start to develop different, uh, forms, uh, uh, different forms of defenses and, and different ways of coping. And a lot of these things are not necessarily healthy. A lot of these things will bring about, uh, especially in children, will bring about, you know, uh, uh, dysfunctional uh, 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 relationships and, and ways of, uh, of coping in their later life. Uh, but especially with, with, uh, with, with wives and husbands, uh, there can be a lot of damage. I've seen... I've seen some very, very ill um, um, spouses in my day, and you know whether or not they were ill on their own or became ill in the alcoholic family unit. Uh, I would certainly say that an alcoholic family unit is not conducive to being 
real healthy and normal and uh, and and uh, and centered. Uh, so a lot of things are going to take place. They they give a lot of warnings in this chapter um, to the family members about what to expect from Daddy. You know, as he is getting sober. Uh, and again, you have to understand that it's written in, in the context of Bill Wilson was writing it. Uh, when he says, you know, don't nag, that's like Bill, you know, saying, you know, don't, don't ever nag the alcoholic, <laughs> you know, because he didn't really particularly care for being nagged. But there's other reasons, you know, um, um, nagging is not really going to help. Um, let's see, over on... Uh, at the very bottom of page 123, the family may be possessed by the idea that future happiness can be based only on forgetfulness of the past. We think that such a view is self-centered and in direct conflict of the new way of living. Henry Ford once made a wise remark to the effect that experience is the thing of supreme value in life. And that's absolutely true. The negative experiences that I've had to go through that have caused me emotional pain in my life have been the things that have really uh, been the maxim of, of maximum benefit uh, to me. I'll give you an example. To do something really humiliating and get, and get, uh, uh, and get nailed for it. Uh, that would motivate me to not do things that would humiliate me. To do things that would get me arrested would usually motivate me into behavior that wouldn't get me arrested. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of times, uh, a lot of times, the the prices that I paid for uh, my aberrant behavior w was the exact thing that was of benefit to me because it motivated me uh, into and, and and being an alcoholic and suffering suffering from untreated alcoholism after putting the bottle down and going to a quadrillion AA meetings and driving people to rehabs and going to the diner and having 55 phone numbers and being the secretary at a meeting and, you know, all that stuff, I was still dying of untreated alcoholism. That was of supreme benefit to me because it motivated me to the point where when I recognized a spiritual course of action, I was willing to take it. People, people who are not sufficiently motivated to go through the steps don't go through them. They just don't. Who the hell wants to do four steps and then go pay the money back and, and apologize to Mrs. McGillicuddy, your eighth grade teacher, for you know, setting her desk on fire or something? I mean, who the hell wants to go back and do all that stuff? They're not lining up out there, you know? Mm -hmm. you, need, you, you, you get motivated to do that because you suffer from untreated alcoholism. You, you're, you're, you're miserable. You're depressed. You have anxiety. You have resentments. And you're filled with self-centered fear. And you're sober three or four years, you know? That's what's going to motivate you sometimes into, uh, into a, a course of action that's going to grant you some freedom from alcoholism. A lot of times you don't even recognize those spiritual maladies as your alcoholism. Uh, but this, this book and, and a lot of people with a lot of experience will tell you, if you suffer from those things, if you suffer from depression and you suffer from anxiety and you suffer from panic attacks and you suffer from resentments and you're, and you're scared to death about all kinds of crap and everything's miserable and you, you know, you know the, the glass is half full, um, ask yourself, is it possible that could be untreated alcoholism? And ask yourself this, is it possible that by treating my alcoholism, I'll be treating my spiritual condition, which really is my alcoholism anyway? You know, so again, the things that, uh, the things that I thought were the worst possible experiences to ever go through when I got into AA ended up being the most valuable, even though I wasn't real happy when I went through them. We grow by our willingness to face and rectify errors and convert them into assets. The alcoholic's past thus becomes the principal asset of the family, and frequently it is the only one. This painful past may be of infinite value to other families still struggling from their problem. We think each family which has been relieved owes something to those who have not, and when the occasion requires each member of it <clears throat> should be only too willing to bring former mistakes, no matter how grievous, out of their hiding places. Showing others who suffer how we were given help is the very thing which makes life seem so worthwhile to us now. And again, um, 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 
for many, many years, uh, uh, my wife and I were very were situated perfectly to be able to do this. And the phone would, you know, and it still does, but the phone would ring off the hook. There'd be alcoholics and downstairs and upstairs doing fist steps and, you know, coming over on the weekend to, to uh, and and it was just great. And uh, again, because there's Al-Anon family groups, uh, we weren't involved with the families as much as they used to be. There's there's a lot of answers for families now besides working with an alcoholic. Um, uh, but there's been times when we've we've uh, we've done that, and uh, uh, a week doesn't go by when we're not on the phone with some family member, giving them some kind of uh, 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 experience of ours, that uh, offering some kind of experience that we've had that might be of help to them. Cling to the thought that in God's hands the dark past is the greatest possession you have, the key to life and happiness for others. With it, you can avert death and misery uh, for them. Another example of this is when I'm in a fist step and I see so, um, somebody's doing a fist step with me and I see them struggling, you know, they're having a hard time admitting this, this thing, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and they're really, really struggling to pull it out. <clears throat> you know, I've had a spiritual awakening. I, I don't care about this stuff anymore. I'll say, I'll say, well, I did that, you know. As a matter of fact, I did it worse than you. Or, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share some of these, these experiences uh, that no longer have an attachment to me. I'll share these experiences, and uh, I'll be able to I'll be able to uh, cut a little bail for the person who's still struggling trying to get through these spiritual exercises. Uh, over on the next page, um, another principle we observe carefully is that we do not relate intimate experiences of another person unless we are sure that he would approve. We find it better when possible to stick to our own stories. This is like an anti-gossip uh, uh, type of statement. And uh, again, uh, uh, I've certainly been, uh, you could certainly find me guilty on many occasions of breaking this. But um, there are times, there are times when, uh, when it's appropriate to talk about, to talk about somebody. You know, uh, it's appropriate to, to share um, about somebody's experience, especially if they're in trouble. One of the very first meetings I ever went to uh, was way back, way back, it was the late 80s. And this guy came into the room and he stuck his hand up and he said, I'm coming back and it was absolute hell. It was absolute hell. I can't believe it. I've lost, lost my family. I've lost my license. I've lost my job. Oh. And somebody shared right after it. And you know what they shared? They shared, you know, I was watching what you were doing. I was watching, and you were headed right out the door. I could see it coming. It's no surprise to me. Guess what happened after the meeting? I think I friggin' jacked that guy up and said, why the hell didn't you tell me if you saw me on the way out the door? You know, what's the matter with you? Do you know what happened to me? <laughs> why didn't you talk to me? And uh, um, I, I, lear I learned from that lesson. You know what I'm saying? Not to, not to share that after somebody says, oh, yeah, I knew you were coming back. I'm not going to do that. Oh, anyway. Down at the bottom of 125, many alcoholics are enthusiasts. They run to extremes. No. <laughs> at the beginning of recovery, a man will take, as a rule, one of two directions. He may either plunge into a frantic attempt to get on his feet in business, or he may be so enthralled by his new life that he talks or thinks of little else in either case, uh, Certain family problems will arise with these. We have had experience galore. I have seen many people come in and they just want to make up for lost time. They just want to make up for lost time. They'll start working 14-hour days. You know, they'll they'll start doing all the things that they think they should have done, and they'll forget. Uh, they'll they'll allow what AA has given them to take them away from AA. And you want to be sure not to have that happen. You don't want what AA has given you to take you away from AA because uh, a lot of times what happens is you lose everything. You know what I mean? If, if, uh, if you concentrate completely on business, you'll be at a business function and uh, you will get struck drunk. Another one of those lip-flapping, uh, party lion, uh, uh, horse crud things that you hear all the time is you don't get struck drunk. Now, on one level... On one level, I'll buy that. I'll say that this, the drink happens 
after a series of events takes place in, in and around your spiritual condition. Absolutely. But I'll also say you, you don't always see it coming. You don't always see it coming because there's delusion. You think you're okay. You think you're keeping yourself sober. You think everything's fine. But you haven't been concentrating on the spiritual program of recovery. You're not sponsoring anybody. You've missed a bunch of meetings. You haven't taken a service commitment since the 60s. Uh, and all of a sudden, geez, I, I, I got drunk. I was, I, you know, I, I was at this party. I wasn't even thinking of drinking. You know, somebody offered me a rum and coke. I just took it and I drank it. And, and, and 10 minutes later, I realized what I did. And, and I hear that a lot in meetings. And I believe the people. I don't believe they were setting themselves up by planning the drink. Sometimes you do, but sometimes you get struck drunk. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes a vodka bottle pops up out of the bushes, and uh, and you're, you end up uh, you end up lizard eyed, and uh, that's just you know it's because you've you've fallen short on the spiritual program of action. But again, you, sometimes you don't see it coming. Uh, we think it dangerous if he rushes headlong into his economic problem. Another thing I see, and this was, this was uh, expressed best by the Cafe Josephine AA Coffee Clutch of about two or three years ago. Uh, there was a number of, uh, number of friends of mine who got sober, uh, and they got so sober and so spiritual they couldn't work. You know, you ever, you ever meet somebody so spiritual they just they can't work? It's just too much. It's like, I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm going to a meeting. I'm praying and meditating, you know? I'm going to the Looney Nooney over in Millington. Uh, uh, so, so they get so they get they're they're so they end up being so heavenly they're no earthly good to anybody. And uh, and again, that's that's the other end of the spectrum. You know what I mean? That's the other end of the spectrum. Uh, one of the one of the, the operational uh, methodologies of Alcoholics Anonymous is finding a balance, finding a healthy balance in a number of things. You know, um, I, I am way prone to being out of balance. Uh, just give you some for instances. Uh, I love music. Uh, I love to get a new CD. You know what I'm saying? Has anybody in here, did anybody in here ever see my music room? <laughs> Somebody walked in there and they said, this is, this is, the, this is a perfect example of obsessive compulsive. This is unbelievable. I had I had like fifteen I had fifteen thousand CDs in a period of about six years. You know I, I would I would buy almost more than I could possibly listen to. Um, there's people that go to the gym seven days a week, fifteen hours a day, and and you know they look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, and then when they when they pick up a crack pipe, you know they wonder what happened. They were so healthy. You know it's it's a uh, and they'll be the deadest healthy guy, you know, in the rooms. But, um, you know, again, uh, an another another way that I, that I got, uh, I got I, I'm a runner, you know, so uh, I run. And uh, uh, there's a there's a bunch of people that uh, are in the group with me, and we all run. And and we were doing little four milers and six milers and marathons. And and uh, uh, April second, uh, we're running. Uh, it's called the River to Sea. It starts at Milford on the Delaware. It goes down to to Lambertville, then it goes across the state to the Matasquan Inlet. It's a 92-mile relay marathon. Yeah? So we're, we're a little bit nuts with, uh, with running. And I, and I have to find some balance there. And, I, and I'm, uh, now that I've said that, it's balance time, I'm afraid. But anyway, uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to make sure that the spiritual part of, uh, of our life remains paramount. Uh, you know, whatever you put in front of AA, uh, you can lose. Um, here we go. It's of little use to argue and only makes the impact. The family must realize that dad, though marvelously improved, is still convalescing. They should be thankful he is sober and able to be uh, of this world once more. Here's another area where the family can be at fault. You know, uh, you get sober. All of a sudden... They want everything to be perfect. Now that you're not drinking, everything's going to be fine. You're going to the PTA. I want you to trim the rose bushes. You know, you need to paint the basement. 
and what are you doing running off to those meetings and who the who the hell is who somebody called today named Bunny asking for the the Serenity Group okay who the hell was that and uh, uh, and they'll uh, you know they'll they'll they'll, they'll start uh, they'll start pressuring on you to uh, to get to get your act together a little bit. Uh, Again, if I'm able to, and, and if I'm in a position where uh, where I can counsel a family, I will basically tell them you got to lay off for a while. You know, you're, you're going to be lucky. The statistics are against this individual surviving. You're going to be lucky if they if they stay sober. Don't discourage anything that has to do with their recovery, please. You know, let them go to their meetings. Let them do let them do their stuff because because they're dying men. You know what I mean? They're dying men if they're alcoholic. We we die. Only a small percent of a percentage of us survive. Uh, let's see. Let them remember that his drinking wrought all kinds of damage uh, that may take long to repair. If they sense these things, they will not take so seriously his periods of crankiness, depression, or apathy, which will disappear when there is tolerance, love, and spiritual understanding. <clears throat> the head of the house ought to remember that he is mainly to blame for what befell his home. He can scarcely square the account in his lifetime. You know, absolutely, absolutely. So, it's sometimes it's sometimes it's just not right to uh, to get sober and then split. You know, and go find Mrs. Understanding. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes amends can take a lifetime. Sometimes amends can take a lifetime. Again, if there is no tolerance, love, and spiritual understanding in the household, the alcoholic may have to leave. I have, I have told people, you got to leave her, pal. <laughs> you know, you got to get out of there. That, that house is killing you. I've had to do that, but that's rare. Uh, although financial recovery is on the way for many of us, we found we could not place money first. Oh, for us, material well-being always followed spiritual progress. It never preceded it. And for me, this was absolutely true. I've only just begun to taste a little bit of the, the financial recovery, uh, okay, just this year. Uh, it was many, many years where I was marginally employed. Uh, but that wasn't my focus. You know, my focus really was my, my, my spiritual program of action. Um, since the home has suffered more than anything else, it is well that a man exert himself here. He is not likely to get far in any direction if he fails to show unselfishness and love under his own roof. Again, these are wonderful principles. They talk about practice the principles in all your affairs. Well, you find a lot of the principles in these chapters. And practicing unselfishness and love under your own roof, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what. This week, go home and practice nothing but unselfishness and love under your own roof, and then get back to me. And let me know how it went. Okay? Uh, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. A lot of times the people in our family know how to aggravate us, and you know all kinds of, uh, of old behaviors uh, are, are, are prone to, uh, uh, to rear their ugly head. It's difficult. But when you see somebody that's able to do this, you know they've recovered with an ED. You know they've recovered. They're not slowly recovering. You ever notice that people that say that identify themselves as slowly recovering alcoholics aren't? It's just something I've noticed. Of course, I don't judge. Anyway, as each member of a resentful family begins to see his shortcomings and admits, and admits them to others. He lays a basis for helpful discussion. These family talks will be constructive if they can be carried on without heated argument, self-pity, self-justification, or resentful criticism. This ties in a lot to, uh, to what they li liked to do in the early days, which was morning meditation together. They, they really tried to engage the family in the spiritual program of recovery. And they really tried to engage the family in honest and open communication. Unlike uh, a lot of us today, uh, who uh, uh, who have problems uh, with with that type of honesty uh, in our in our home life? But if you can get to that point where you can be brutally honest, you're going to grow. You know, your family is going to grow closer and closer together together with that honesty. Uh, 
giving rather than getting will become the guiding principle. And that's a guiding principle that you can use in your Alcoholics Anonymous fellowship activity. You know, um, give rather than get. Go to a meeting for what you can bring to it and what you can offer to those there rather than, than going to a meeting so that you'll feel better or, or, the, or to keep you from drinking. You know, go to, go to give rather than get. Uh, it's through giving that you receive. And it's through teaching that you learn. And, and th- these, are all, uh, uh, these, are, these are all principles that are so true in Alcoholics Anonymous. They're spiritual principles. And Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritual program. So they, they work here. And if you really, really want to get this, if you really want uh, to get the freedom that can be offered here, do that. Start working with other people. You know, get involved with the meetings. Uh, take people through the book Alcoholics Anonymous. There's not a thing that's, that'll make you a stronger member uh, in, in good standing in AA than to do something like that. Bottom of page 129. Though the family does not fully agree with Dad's spiritual activities, they should let him have his head. Even if he displays a certain amount of neglect and irresponsibility toward the family, it is well to let him go as far as he likes in helping other alcoholics. This is back when they used to bring the bring drunks into the house, you know. And the, um, I was I was lucky enough to hear Bob Smith uh, Jr. speak not long ago, uh, and he talked about when he would come home, he could smell the peraldehyde, and he knew that he didn't have a bedroom anymore. And they would just they would just uh, bring these bring these alcoholics into the house, and you know. Uh, uh, and we've 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 done that, and my wife and I have done that at various periods of time in our life. Um, we're not really able to do it uh, where we're living now, uh, but uh, uh, unless the alcoholic stays out in the shed, <laughs> which I'm not ruling out as a possibility. Uh, but uh, uh, but that you know, and I'm telling you, as the as the detoxes and the rehabs close, you know, be open to that, people. I mean, don't don't say not in my house. I mean, please be open to it. Uh, you may save someone's life by doing that someday. Um, during uh, those first days of convalescence, this will do more to ensure his sobriety than anything else for him to be around alcoholics and even working with alcoholics. And again, uh, you know, one of the things that I used to hear and, that I couldn't stand, uh, I believed it for a while, like I believed a lot, a lot, a lot of the, the wrong information that you get in AA, but I believe that you needed to have a year before you could sponsor somebody. Okay, that's what they told me when I was brand new. Don't sponsor anybody for a year. Like some magical thing will happen at day 365 where you'll all, all of a sudden we automatically not kill the person or something, you know. Uh, it talks about in working with others, no, nothing will so much ensure your immunity from drinking than intensive work with other alcoholics. It says in here, in your... During the first days of convalescence, nothing will do more to ensure his sobriety uh, than, to, uh, than to help other alcoholics. Um, as soon as you can start to offer something to somebody, do that. It's, it's the spirit of service. It's the spirit of giving. It's the spirit of, of uh, helping another alcoholic that, that offers, uh, offers so much power uh, into your into your program, uh, into your uh, spiritual condition, it's it's unbelievable. Though some of his manifestations are alarming and disagreeable, we think Dad will be on a firmer foundation than the man who is placing business or professional success ahead of his spiritual development. He will be less likely to drink again, and anything is preferable to that if he spends time working with other alcoholics. Those of us who have spent much time in the world of spiritual make-believe have eventually seen the childishness of it. This dream world has been replaced by a great sense of purpose, accompanied by a growing consciousness of the power of God in our lives. That sentence means so much to me today, so much to me this year, you know, where I've been growing this year, because uh, I continue to practice the principles. I'm going through the steps right now. Uh, uh, an individual is taking me through the steps right now, and it's it's a new experience. One more time, you know. I'm not one of these people that believe you go through the steps and you're fine the rest of your life. All you have to do is pray and meditate every once in a while and help an alcoholic. I really think that the principles need to be uh, uh, um, recycled through your life. And, and I'm doing that today, and I'm so glad that I am. 
because that's about where I am. I am really, really understanding uh, the power of God in my life. I'm coming to a, a deeper understanding of that, uh, that just how much, uh, how much God influenced my, influences my life today. We've come to believe that he would like us to keep our head in the clouds with him and that our feet ought to be firmly planted on the earth. This is where our fellow travelers are. This is where our work must be done. These are the realities for us. We have found nothing incompatible between a powerful spiritual experience and a life of sane and happy use usefulness. That's unbelievably true for me. One more suggestion. Whether the fam family has spiritual convictions or not, they may do well to examine the principles by which the alcoholic member is trying to live. They may, be, be, may do well to practice some of those principles also, but at least to examine them. Uh, they can hardly fail to approve these simple principles, though the head of the house still fails somewhat in practicing them. Nothing will help the man who is off on a spiritual tangent so much as the wife who adopts a sane spiritual program, making better practical use of it. And I think in Bill and Dr. Bob's cases, their wives did work better programs than they did. Uh, and uh, it probably did help them. Uh, help them. Over 131. Uh, Father, coming suddenly to life again often begins to assert himself. This means trouble unless the family watches for these tendencies in each other and comes to a friendly agreement about them. Here's something that happens a lot. Uh, Dad has been drunk for 10 years and, uh, and mom has been taking care of the finances, uh, taking care of the school, making sure the kids got to soccer practice, taking care of everything, right? And what dad was able to do was go to work, bring home a paycheck, and get drunk like, like, like a goat every night. Okay? All of a sudden, he's not drunk anymore. He starts looking around. He starts noticing the checkbook register, you know, noticing the report cards, noticing uh, uh, the credit card uh, debt and start saying, hey, you know, what about this? What about this? And it's going to bring about some heavy-duty resentment. It's going to bring about, you didn't goddamn care about this stuff for the last 10 years. You were drunk. Why are you sticking your nose in it now? And, uh, and I've seen this happen a lot. Uh, uh, again, you know, if the family can, can work through this uh, uh, using some spiritual principles, it will help. Bottom of page 171. At the very beginning, the couple ought to frankly face the fact that each will have to yield here and there if the family is going to play an effective part in the new life. Father will necessarily spend much of his time with other alcoholics, but this activity should be balanced. New acquaintances who know nothing of alcoholism might be made and thought for thoughtful consideration given of their needs. So it's telling us don't isolate an AA. Don't hide an AA. There's a world out there. There's, there's social life out there. There's other people out there. You know, don't hermit yourself in Alcoholics Anonymous and not stick your head out the door. The problems of the community might engage attention. Though the family has no religious connections, they may wish to make contact or with or take membership in a religious body. Uh, again, uh, as far as religion is concerned, here's what our co-founders did. Uh, Dr. Bob became religious after he got sober. He went back to church. There was a pew. You could always find him in every single Sunday. Bill Wilson never became religious. He studied religions, but he never became religious. There was a period of time when he, when he uh, took, took uh, lessons from the Catholic Church moving toward a membership, but he just couldn't buy into the liturgical hoofrah, you know. Uh, he, could, he, he, just, he just wouldn't do it. Um, he definitely did have uh, uh, Catholic spiritual advisor stuff. Uh, that he would go to. Father Ed Dowling was a great friend of his uh, for a long period of time. And an Episcopal minister, Sh Sam Shoemaker. Again, these are things that you make up on your own. You can run a spiritual program of recovery without being religious. There's no doubt about that. Okay, 132. We've been speaking to you of serious, sometimes tragic things. We've been dealing with alcohol and its worst aspect, but we are not a glum lot. If newcomers could see no joy or fun in our existence, they wouldn't want it. We absolutely insist on enjoying, enjoying life. We try not to indulge in cynicism over the state of the nations, nor do we carry the world's trouble on our shoulders. Uh, when we see a man sinking into the mire that is alcoholism, we give him first aid, place what we have at his disposal. Uh, for his sake, we do recount and almost relive the horrors of our past, but those of us who have tried to shoulder the entire burden and trouble of others will find that uh, we are soon overcome by them. Absolutely. 
We think cheerfulness and laughter make for usefulness. You ever see those meetings, uh, um, the, the glum lot meetings, where there's people who've been sober a long period of time, but there's just absolutely nothing happening there in the meeting? There's no smiling, there's no laughter, it's like a castor oil meeting. That's not what this book is telling us is available. There's more available than that. All right. Why shouldn't we laugh? We have recovered and have been given the power to help others. Uh, now, about health. A body badly burned by alcohol does not often recover overnight, nor do twisted thinking and depression vanish in a twinkling. We are convinced that a spiritual mode of living is the most powerful health restorative. We who have recovered from serious drinking are miracles of mental health, but we've seen remarkable transformations in our bodies. I'll tell you, if you're drinking alcoholically, you're, you're, mal, mal, uh, you, uh, you're suffering from mal malnutrition, you're suffering from vitamin deficiencies, uh, you're usually either over or underweight, uh, you usually have tons and tons of empty calories that you're ingesting. Just, just stopping drinking is going to help you to a certain extent. Uh, uh, but again, you know, uh, and this isn't from the book, but I, I recommend it to the people I sponsor. I, I, I recommend uh, ca cardio. Find something that you can do that, that, that offers you some cardio and, and some endorphin, uh, uh, endorphin stuff. Uh, try to remember that through God, uh, though God has wrought miracles among us, we should never be little a good doctor or psychiatrist. Again, good. Make sure that you understand the word good. Uh, out there, there are doctors and psychiatrists that know nothing of alcoholism or the, 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 the bag of, of issues and, and problems that an alcoholic has. Another thing I used to hear a lot in the meetings when I was first coming around, always tell a doctor or your dentist you're an alcoholic so they don't prescribe the wrong thing for you. Let me tell you, that doesn't do anything. There's maybe maybe 10% of the doctors out there understand what you're talking about. So many times you'll say, look, doc, I'm an addict, I'm a junkie, I can't take pain pills. Well, it's only a Percocet, you know? <laughs> you gotta take it. What, are you gonna suffer with the pain? Yeah, you're going to suffer with the pain. Because if you're an addict, you've lost the right to, to take painkillers. You don't have that right anymore. You know? But a doctor won't tell you that. A doctor will say, oh, you know, here's an Oxycontin. It's new. It's non, it's non habit forming. You know? It's non habit forming. Yeah, for Aunt, Aunt Fanny doesn't get addicted to it, okay? If you're an alcoholic, you're an addict. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to be in Newark, you know, selling blood, trying to get crack in about two, two days. You know? So, and, and, the, and the doctor doesn't understand this. So, a good doctor, okay? And a good psychiatrist. A good psychiatrist does not immediately put you on 17,000 different antidepressant medications before they figure out what's going on with you, okay? Uh, important warning sign for all those people who go, who go to psychiatrists. Allow them to at least properly diagnose you before, before they put you on 14 medications, that are good, that's going to interfere with, with, with your spiritual condition, okay? Good doctors, good psychiatrists. A word about, here we go, I'm going to finish with this. Uh, a word about sex, uh, a word about sex relations. Okay, I'm going to show you that this doesn't happen anymore in Alcoholics Anonymous. Something's happened, they're putting something in the water. Uh, I'll show you. Alcohol is so sexually stimulating that some men, uh, to some men that they have, have uh, overindulged. Couples are occasionally dismayed to find that when drinking is stopped, the man tends, tends to be impotent. All men in here that have been impotent uh, when they stop drinking, raise your hand. <laughs> See? See? Doesn't happen. Okay? Doesn't happen. Uh, whether the family goes on a, uh, on a spiritual basis or not, the alcoholic member has to if he would recover. All right. Well, that wraps it up for the family afterwards being presented by our good friend and Take 12 Recovery Radio contributor, Chris S. Now, uh, if all goes well, we plan on bringing back Walking Through the Language of the Heart the next episode next Friday. Uh, we'll let you know, though. We'll keep you informed. Okay. So that's what we're looking forward to. 
Listen, uh, we have all sorts of workshops at Take 12 Recovery Radio. Simply visit our website at take12radio.com and spend some time digging into the pages there. You will find literally hundreds of broadcasts that we have created for you, all for fun and for free. Until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man along with the rest of the Take 12 Recovery Radio family, and we are wishing God's perfect serenity for you. For more recovery workshops with Chris S. and the Monty Man, visit our website at take12radio.com and click on the Recovery Workshops banner. This has been a broadcast of Take 12 Recovery Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Kitty, 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 meow, meow, meow. Woof, woof.